breakfast puppies? This podcast contains adult language and content and is meant for mature audiences. Listener discretion is advised. You're listening to The Glitter Boys. We are back with an episode focused on the rules, and this time we're looking at house rules. That's right. There is a lot of... There's a lot of palladium out there, and for the most part, uh, most of it is transferable back and forth. However, as with any monolithic, huge construction, there there are some rough edges, and every now and then you're going to want to take a belt sander and grind some of those off. And uh, the best belt sander for dealing with any any, any kind of, of tabletop game is house rules. Now, we have several games that we're involved in that are in the Palladium universe. We got three and about to be a fourth. Yeah, and we're going to talk about what we use. And uh, as NPC is our game master, I'm going to kick this back over your way. Uh, what do you, you use and what do you consider the parts that really need the refinement that you've had to make for yourself? <laughs> well, Let's take a couple steps back here so I can explain myself. First off, a house rule, if you're unfamiliar with this, and I'm, I'd be surprised if you are unfamiliar, but basic concept being your own rules for a game beyond those that are published in the book, either to fill in a gap or to fix issues that you have with the rules as they are written. With every game I run, regardless of system, I use house rules. I have since I first started running games. I have never played in a game where the GM didn't use house rules. I've published games. I use house rules when I run those games. House (laughs) rules are necessary, be it to, to make a game more appetizing to your current group, or be it You know, I love everything about this game except this one aspect or these five aspects. Never have I run a game without house rules. I'll also say that players are infinite in their creativity and their ability to bring something new to the table. And you just can't expect any written rule system to cover every eventuality that a player will bring up. So even if you don't currently use house rules, you've used something very similar just to... Just to cover that weird moment where that player asked to do that one thing and that one thing, God, there's just no table on that in the book. So you've had to make a hard and fast ruling. And that's that's just part of tabletop role playing. And chances are you've played popular games with house rules and not even known it. I believe that the most used house rule in all of tabletop gaming historically Is the free parking rule in Monopoly. Yes, agreed. That whole land on free parking, get the pot, that's not a rule. But everyone learned to play it that way for some reason. So house rules are something you're probably already familiar (laughs) with, even if you think you're not. House rules invade every aspect of the game, be it from how we roll our character stats at the very beginning, to how we handle combat damage, to how we handle skills progression, and everything in between. Falling damage, swimming rules, radiation poisoning, people add rules for whatever the hell that they feel like is something that they want to focus on in their game. I'm going to make a personal appeal at this point. Mr. Sambita, I, I am a huge admirer of your work, but the missiles, the, the missiles. <laughs> okay, sorry. It does feel when I read Rifts and Palladium books that sometimes it's somebody's own house rules for the game have been spliced in. Yeah. There is some inconsistency with the rules from time to time. Missiles definitely being one of them. And some of the ways that missiles are implemented, I I definitely agree. We could note to self, Matthew, you and I, we're going to do a fucking missiles episode at some point in the future because I got a lot to say about it. (laughs) I've got words about Robotech. Okay, I think your original question was, tell me about your favorite house rules, was it? Yeah, and and why you felt them necessary. Got it. Well, most of the times I I use a house rule either to maintain a level of consistency with something. As you were saying a minute ago, 
the most common reason that house rules come up is because of a ruling that you have to make on the fly. I play a lot of games that require rulings. Most Mm -hmm. games I play now follow the mindset of rulings over rules. So you can create a game with a minimal rule set that's designed to accommodate certain focus areas of play and action Uh that expect the group to come up with rulings on the weird oddball situation. A lot of the OSR or old school Renaissance style games, a lot of them also favor that mentality. It's a very old school back in the day before the arrival of third edition D&D style of play. I love house rules. I I love I'm a game designer at heart and I love taking an existing system and molding it to meet my needs. I house rule almost every aspect of play. I do. We start with character creation, you know, like Rifts has its 3D6 down the line rule for basic stuff, but how do you handle games where you want to have uh, people with more more higher stats on average? Yeah. Like when I started playing Palladium, The very first game I ever played with Palladium, the GM had a house rule. This is the first game I ever played that wasn't even just Palladium. First game ever, house rule. Roll 4d6, drop the lowest. Yeah, and I've played in many, many games uh, in different systems that had the same rule. Uh, Second edition D&D, for example. There, there There is an expectation that unless you're specifically in a world where you're playing a commoner, that you are going to be a hero or an anti-hero. You are, you are above the norm. Yeah, and what's fascinating about Rifts is that, and Palladium in general, the stat system demonstrates that to its, in its own special way by only giving modifiers to people who have exceptional stats. The idea being that anything below these stats isn't really worth noting. You're just a normal, you, the normal yeah. rules apply to you. But if you are exceptional, that's what we care about. Which is an interesting take on stats, because if you come from back in the day playing AD&D and characters with low stats were terrible at things. <laughs> yes. Yeah. The, and there was there was a modifier plus or negative for every step up yeah. or down. Rifts doesn't do that. Palladium doesn't do that in general. What I believe one of the house rules that we're using in our Metalark is, what was it, 16 or above was when it's, you started it? Yeah, so 12? by default, it starts at 16 is when you get bonuses. Some yeah. of the Palladium games start at 17 for some reason. They just chop off 16 and then go from 17 up the same mm. as if 16 didn't exist. But what we do is, historically, Palladium's not had low stat modifiers until the Ultimate Edition of Rifts came around. And then they had these overly complex rules for low stat multiple pages of what to do with a low stat that I I feel were unnecessary. Like you could have just made it as simple as a chart. So I remember seeing in my teens or twenties passing around, someone had made a low attribute table, which was essentially a mirror of the high attribute table that I think started around like nine or 10 or so and went downward. Yeah. Again, I I don't really use that either. So, well, I also wanted the stats to matter somewhat, even if they weren't a 16 or higher. So if you have a stat of 13 or higher, it counts as if it was a 16. And then starting at 17, it just proceeds up normally. So, for example, that plus one to physical strength that you get at 16, you also get at 13, 14, and 15 kind of thing. So it extends it a little bit further downward. And then I think starting at eight downward... I do a very simple either minus two, minus one, minus two, or minus three to various things based upon how far down you go. If you're familiar with the old school D&D plus three to minus three stat spread, it's very similar to that. Yeah, it, it was familiar the first time you you introduced it. Let's let's touch briefly on how you've streamlined combat. <laughs> because... You you have a lot of actions in in Palladium. Uh, if you are of a, a certain type, you can you can fire up to five or six times, depending on on what you've taken your your hand to hand skill in. Well, not hand to hand, but you, you you can make five to six different actions. That's a lot of time spent on a character. So let's talk a little bit about uh, what you've done to streamline that. Our combat rules have gone through iterations. <laughs> We started with something where I was using like 
if you're familiar with things like the Divinity Original Sin series of video games, what was ultimately an action pool? I just took actions per melee, turned it into an action pool of dice or used use the die as the standard currency of action and worked with that because I wanted to minimize the slog of multiple rounds of combat that come with people who have a lot of actions. It was pretty confusing and it made sense to me, but again, I wrote it and I don't think I really overly explained it well. I whined a little bit too. That that has to be said. Yeah. So I went back and we're doing something very close to normal, but my biggest complaints with combat that I want to create rules for are, I already said, the fact that somebody with a lot of actions and or attacks can just dominate a round at the very beginning if they go first. And also, I want to find ways to incentivize players taking actions other than their most optimal attack. Right. Because... With Palladium, your combat skill gives you a bajillion different combat moves, punches, kicks, holds, elbow jabs, knee jabs, backflips and stuff. And no one ever uses them because they have their gun. Their gun does the most damage and they're just going to use that click, 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 click next. So I want to incentivize more fluid combat. To partially address this, I've changed the way initiative works. Well, I've changed the way initiative works twice. We don't roll the D20. We roll a D100 and add speed to it because I wanted speed to kind of matter. So now somebody who's really fast is going to typically go first in combat. It ends up working out for us very well. But when it comes to taking your turn, I set things up in kind of a popcorn round. So like you take an action and if that action targets someone else, now it's their turn to take an action. And if their action targets you again, okay, it's back to you to take one of your next actions. But if your next action helps out your buddy, okay, cool. Now we switch to your buddy. It's your buddy's turn to take an action. If your buddy is targeting an enemy, okay, when their action's done, now it's the enemy's turn. So it's sort of a camera flow. Yeah, it's 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 more cinematic. Yeah. Yeah. But that's basically my initiative system. And it just keeps going that way until you're out. And if you're out of actions, move to the next person in line. Yeah. Let's see. What else have we polished here? We have a lot going on. <laughs> I use a roll high skill system so that you're not constantly constrained by those abysmally low skill numbers that you get in Palladium for some reason. That's one of them. And the missiles, custom missiles rules. Because <laughs> I, I wanted to, I want some max throwing action going on here. I mentioned this on a previous episode. I had to get cooler missile rules. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. I I think <laughs> that it's 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 important. Every gaming group is is different, and you're going to have to tailor the game to your gaming group's both understanding level of the game mechanic itself and to their play style. You, you shouldn't expect a game to cover every possible iteration of what the infinitely inventive and chaotic human can dream up. I, I, I tend to play weird characters that do weird things at weird times for weird reasons, I, I couldn't write a rule set to cover what I do. So you're going to have to fly on the seat of your pants as a, as a GM sometimes and be prepared to make rulings or hard and fast rules to, to cover something weird. So those who are, are purists and just believe in the, in the rules as written, the, the raw rules, you, you should loosen that a little bit otherwise you'll find yourself in a bit more of a constrained play style agreed you need to be open with the concept of rulings but also you need to be firm with your group and make sure that they know understand and accept the fact that when you make a ruling that's it that ruling has been made if a ruling is made at the table there should be no arguments about it we make the rule, we, we, we make the ruling and we move on so that we can keep playing the game. Ideally, the situation is something happens in play. I don't have a rule to cover this situation. I'm going to make a ruling. We're going to stick with it for now. It might change afterward. You cannot expect this to reliably happen again. If it's exploitable, we'll fix it later. Right. Yeah. Like grenades. 
Oh, dear God. So many of my <laughs> rulings are made on behalf of Matthew's character. Let me just make sure that everybody is aware of this. My guy goes boom a lot. He's not a, he's not a min-maxer. No. He's not a munchkin. He just does some crazy fucking shit that I never expect to happen. <laughs> I suppose the long and short takeaway of this is if, if you're feeling guilty about changing any of the rules, don't. Don't. Uh, it, it needs to fit your play style. It needs to fit your group. And it needs to fit your, your view. These books are fantastic resources and should be used. But unless you're in a tournament with money on the line, there, there's no reason to do things all the time as written. Ke- Make it yours. Kevin is not going to show up at your house and tell you that you are playing <laughs> it wrong and take your books away because Kevin uses house rules too. <laughs> Is there anything else you wanted to hit in house rules? I think I did want to give a shout out to my favorite house rule of all time. Yeah. Exploding dice. Oh, yes. I don't use it in every game, but I will be using it very soon in our fourth game, which we'll tell you about in the near future, dear listener. Exploding dice. The concept being every die, regardless of the size, when you roll it and that maximum number comes up, you keep that, but you take another die of equivalent size and then you roll that die. And you add the new die to the original die. Because sometimes heroes do cool shit. And if that die gets a maximum, you do it again. And again and again and again and again until you no longer hit that maximum roll. Savage Worlds did this. It's something I always loved about Savage Worlds. So sometimes I adapt that and bring it into rifts. It makes for some insane characters and setups. We'll yeah, talk about agreed. that very shortly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you everyone for listening in and uh, you can catch us next time. We're actually going to be building a Rift's character with you. And we're going to take you through the steps so that you understand how to take these tomes and make a character that's uniquely your own. And we'll dive into all the different and various steps of that And we really hope this helps you in in your gaming through Palladium. Thanks again for listening. Bye. You've been listening to The Glitter Boys, a Palladium Books fan podcast. Glitter Boys, Rifts, the Megaverse, and all other such topics are the property of Kevin Sambita and Palladium Books. Please buy all their stuff and help keep them in print and making more games. You can order directly at PalladiumBooks.com, and their entire catalog is available digitally at DriveThruRPG as well. Our opening music is 8-Bit Bass and Lead by Furby Guy from Freesound.org. This closing music is Caravana by Philip Gross, available at FreeMusicArchive.org. All sound effects used are self-made or acquired via Creative Commons Zero License. If you like what you have heard, find us on Twitter and Facebook as The Glitter Boys. That's B-O-I-S. And check us out online at breakfastpuppies.com slash glitterboys. And also join us on the Breakfast Puppies Network Discord at breakfastpuppies.com slash discord. And if you want to help us out, please spread the word and help us build a community. Thanks again for listening. We'll catch you next time. 